remember to pray for her. Uh, children are to dismissed to go to children's church at this time. Pastor Rich is going to come and minister. Greetings, everybody. Good to be back at church with you all. God is good. Amen. Hey, there's also cards back there for the uh, for tonight's uh, for tonight's joy performance we or celebration. There's cards back here on the tables, a couple different places so you can invite people to come. Uh, last night they had a complete rehearsal from beginning to end. The whole team was up here worshiping, and uh, Pastor Marvin Moreland and Pastor Eric Phillips from uh, Pastor Marvin's from Deliverance Temple. Pastor Eric is from Mount Carmel. We were sitting in the back row there talking, and Eric says, you know what? He says, I think we're going to have a problem tomorrow night. I said, what's the problem? He says, I don't think this place is going to hold everybody that's going to come. Amen. And uh, I said, that'd be, a good, that'd be a good problem to have, you know. And uh, so, so you know, he just said that. And I said, are you serious? And he says, yeah, I think so. I'm looking around here, and I think we're going to have this. Is, you know, I've seen it on Facebook from all different kind of uh, people on Facebook and advertising. He says, our congregation is excited. He says, I, he says, we're looking forward to it. He says, I think this, we might have a seating problem. I said, that's right. I said, we can, we can, that's a problem we can deal with, you know. So with that conversation, and I was going to ask you all to do this anyhow, I would like for those of you that are healthy enough to walk on some grass with some leaves on it, uh, to park tonight in the back, park on the back section back here. We're going to have some folks going to help with parking. <clears throat> we want to get, leave our, all the blacktop spaces open for our guests. Uh, that are, it's better lit there than it is back there. We have some big floodlights on the back of the building that will shine back there. You won't have to like grope your way through the darkness using your your $500 flashlight, you know, find, to find your car. Uh, so uh, those of you that are uh, coming tonight, I appreciate it if you park in the back here, back this evening, just to make room for our, for our guests. So let's all stand. We'll prepare our hearts to receive God's word this morning. Father, we just thank you for the fullness of your spirit that is our revelation here at Wildwood Chapel. And God, we just ask that you would continue to unfold that to us, that we even a greater level, that each of us would come to a greater level of appreciation for you, Holy Spirit, and your work in our lives. We would come to a greater awareness of our need of you in our lives. We would come to a, a greater place of walking in co-partnership and co-relationship with you that we might carry out the great commission that you have uh, uh, bestowed upon each one of us as followers of Jesus. And Jesus, we just thank you so much because all of this is available to us and because of you, because of your love for us, because of your obedience, leaving your throne in glory, coming to the earth, taking on the form of man. <clears throat> we thank you for the celebration of Christmas and your birth uh, that makes your life in us and through us possible. We just thank you for that. And Holy Spirit, we just ask that you would lead and guide and direct us this morning. You would empower me to bring forth a word that, will, uh, that affirms the truth of Jesus and that will feed and nourish our spirit man, spirit woman, and ca cause us to be able to become more transformed into the likeness of you, Lord Jesus. We might bring you glory and honor. We ask these things in your name. Amen. Turn to someone and say, I want to bring glory and honor to Jesus. <clears throat> the title of my message this morning is, Who Was and Is and Is to Come. Who Was and Is and Is to Come. And who is that person, who was and is and is to come? Jesus, indeed. Indeed. Satan is very stealthy in his attempts to deceive people from coming to experience the saving, delivering power of Jesus. Very stealthy. And you know what it means to be stealthy? It means to be, to be flying in radar, flying in, in systems that can detect you and you can't be te detected. You know, uh, there are animals that are stealthy. You know, there, are, there are like snow leopards. When it's white, you can't see the snow leopard. There are snow leopards in Asia that are so rare, there's only been a few people that have ever been able to film them because they blend in perfectly with, the, with the, uh, the background of the snow and all that, and they move in such a way uh, through the snow, you can't even see the movement. They're so they're, it's camouflaged. So Satan has camouflaged religion. Satan has camouflaged things to keep us from the real deal. Now, that snow leopard, it's a, it's a, it's a thing that God has created him to be, that he's able to both protect himself from predators, but also hide himself from those that he's, that he's after. 
And it's the same thing. Satan is a, the Bible says that Satan is a roaring lion, roaming the earth to and like a roaring lion, roaming the earth to and fro, seeking those that he may devour. The scripture says that Satan can appear to us as if he was an angel of light himself, a messenger of God, speaking the truth. Every world religion that denies the deity of Jesus is a, of an antichrist spirit. It is the stealth operation of Satan to keep us from the real deal. How many of you were caught up in a religious system prior to you coming to know Jesus as your personal savior and you, you were doing the ins and outs and the, keeping the code of conduct and doing all the things of the religious uh, uh, organization that you were a part of and all along thinking that by doing and performing that you were going to be in right relationship with God. How many of you had the idea that good people go to heaven and bad people go to hell? How many had, had that idea? You know? So that was a stealthy work of Satan that kept you in a, in a religious form that denied the power of who Jesus was. You know, all religions te teach some form of performance-based acceptance and graduation into the next life because of a person's ability to perform their religious duties and requirements. That goes all the way into the Eastern mysticism stuff of, uh, of Buddhism and Hinduism and uh, reincarnation and all these kinds of things where you, where you, you know, by performing in such a way, you get to become elevated to a higher level and you come back, your spirit leaves your body and comes back at some higher level because of the way that you perform. So it's all based upon your performance. Um, now, all religions recognize Jesus. You cannot deny Jesus. Anyone that would deny that Jesus was a person who walked the earth would be a fool. You know, there's, there's more historical records, there's more documentation, there's more proof that Jesus walked the earth than many of the presidents that we've had. You know, so, so there's more written information that is there, not just from the Bible, but we have, we have a, a host of historians that wrote from, from the Greek philosophies, from uh, ancient Hebrew, uh, Josephus, other, other writers that have written about the life of Jesus. So it's impossible to deny that he walked the earth. But what happens is, all world religions, all religions that are, that are, that are being fueled by an antichrist spirit, uh, all those that deny the power of Jesus and the deity of Jesus, they have, I can talk, I've had conversations with Muslims, uh, Jehovah's Witnesses, Mormons, New Agers, uh, a Mooney, I don't even know if they're even around anymore, if anybody knew who, know who the Moonies were, followed Reverend Sung Mung Moon back in the you know, um, 70s and 80s. He was since kicked out of the country. He's not allowed into the country, but I don't, know if, I don't know if his followers are still following him or not, or if he's even still alive. I haven't heard anything from, about them for years. But I've had conversation with all those individuals. And you can have a conversation with anybody of any religion and use the word God and have a nice, uh, non-hostile conversation for hours talking about God. God, 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 God. You know, God as you know him. You know, we have, even in, even in the 12-step program, the 12-step recovery program that used to be based solely on scripture, when Bill Wilson, the guy that got the 12-step program started, it was a Christian program. Every 12-step had scriptures that supported it. It wasn't God as you know him, it was Jesus was the higher power. And the only way you can become free from addiction is by recognizing your helplessness, your need of a savior, and receiving Jesus as your savior, receiving his power to transform your life, and it was a very effective program. Satan has got in there very stealthily and has changed the program to now we use the, they use the 12 step program, uses the term God as you know him. So it could be anything. It could be your uncle, it could be, it could be your grandfather who you think is watching over you and taking care of you or whatever. I mean, it could be anything that you want. You can be any religion. You could be a Muslim, you could be a Hindu, you can be a Buddhist, you could be an atheist. It could be the oak tree in your front yard that gives you strength and serenity, and that becomes your higher power. And you draw your strength from the, from, the, from the branches of the oak tree or the acorns that fall on your head while you're sitting underneath there contemplating or whatever. You know? So what's happened is it's become ineffective. The program isn't, I don't know anybody who's used the 12-step program to overcome addiction that their higher power wasn't Jesus. 
I've never had a conversation with anybody that says their higher power is Buddha or their higher power is whatever, and, and they've gotten clean, clean and, and so sober from addiction. I don't know. Anybody? Does anybody know anyone that has? I mean, everyone I've ever met that uses a 12-step program, Jesus was the higher power. Amen. He is the only higher power. He is power. He is life. You know, anything else is a counterfeit. Anything, anything else is a spirit of Antichrist. Anything else is a stealthy attempt of Satan to deny the deity of Jesus. That's what religion does. That's what world religions do. Look at Revelations with me. Revelations chapter 1. We're going to read verses 4 through 8. I had conversations with all these various religions, and you could talk about God all day long. But when you bring up the name Jesus, uh, you know, in a very few minutes, the whole, the whole, the whole atmosphere is going to change, the attitude is going to change, and your newfound friend is no longer going to be your friend who you thought was maybe a possibly newfound friend to talk about the things of God. Because you can talk to them, I've talked to Muslims, Jesus was a prophet. He was no different than Isaiah or a bunch of other prophets. He's just, he's just one of many prophets. He is not the sinless sacrifice. He is, his death on the cross has no significance whatsoever. Lots of people died on the cross back in the day. There was a thief on the one side and what was it, a murderer on the other side or whatever that was being uh, crucified with Jesus on the cross. You know, it was just an everyday occurrence. You know, it, was, it was no big deal. He, just, he died on a cross. So what? You know, did he raise from the dead? Did he ascend into heaven and bring out all those, all those that were looking for his appearance and bring them into, into eternity? No, not, you know, they, they, none of those things happen. Muslims don't believe any of those things happen. They just believe that he was a teacher. He was a teacher. You cannot deny his existence. You cannot deny his impact on the world. You cannot deny his teachings. So they'll pick and choose from those, from those teachings. Jesus is quoted in the Quran, but he's not quoted in the Quran Accurately, he's not quoted in the Quran uh, in, the, in the sense of who he is. He is, he is part of the tripartness of God. He is God. He was 100% human and 100% man. It isn't the case. When you begin to say, when you begin to communicate to someone who does not believe that Jesus is the Son of God, you begin to communicate that to them that Jesus is the way and the truth and the life, and no man can come to the Father unless he comes to the Father through Jesus. You're gonna, there's going to be a holy war going to go on right there. That's going to that's be the parting of it because they don't believe that. They don't embrace that. Uh, the, Mormons don't, well, the Mormons don't embrace that. The Jehovah's Witnesses don't embrace that. Uh, Muslims don't embrace that. Of course, Hinduism, Buddhism, all the isms of the Middle East, all of those things don't embrace that. So let's see what, what this... Uh, because it, it's, it's believed in all those religions that Jesus was just a man. He was born a man. He wasn't born of a virgin. He wasn't born, he wasn't, uh, Mary was not uh, impregnated by the, by the Holy Ghost to bring forth Jesus. He was just a man who lived and walked on the earth. The whole story about Mary and the virgin birth and all that's just kind of a little sidebar for her trying to get out of her indiscretion, you know, and all this other kind of stuff. They explain all that, all that away. This is not valued. This is not the highest authority that governs the religion. All the religions that I've mentioned do not, they'll use this, but this is not. The Mormons have the Book of Moroni, which is the higher revelation. So the, whatever the Book of Moroni says that's contrary to the scriptures, they don't have a problem with that because the Book of Moroni is superior over the scriptures. You know, we have the Watchtower uh, writings. We have all these various things that, are, that take superiority over the Word of God. So the Word of God is not embraced as being the authoritative. You, you can't argue about it with them with the word of God because they don't value the word of God. You can't argue the Bible to an atheist. Why? Because the atheist has no value. He doesn't value this. He doesn't value this in any way whatsoever. This is, to an atheist, this is no different than the Zeus and Poseidon and all the Greek gods and whatever. You know, it's no, it's no different to them. It's no different to them. It, it doesn't mean anything. They don't care what the Bible says. Just a book written by a bunch of men. Just as much as it might as well be, uh, what is it, Aesop's Fables or... Uh, you know, there's some kind of little, like, fictitious kind of a writing. So let's see what the scripture says about this Jesus. Revelations 1, verse 4 through 8. This is non-negotiable, guys. 
This, you know, the, you know what, I'm, what I'm saying today is non-negotiable. I mean, this, is, this, separates, this separates the believers from the non-believers. This separates those that have their name <coughs> written in the book of life and those that don't have their name in the book of life. Revelations 1, verses 4 through 8. John to the seven churches which are in Asia. Grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and, and who is to come and from the seven spirits who are before his throne. Who's he talking about right here? Is he? No, he's talking about God right here. We'll see that because the very next verse he starts talking about Jesus. So he's talking about God who was and is and who is to come. So he's talking about, he's talking about the eternal existence of God. Verse 5, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler over the kings of the earth, to him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood, and has made us kings and priests to his God and Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he is coming with clouds and every eye. Who's he talking about now here? Jesus, right? We're still talking about Jesus. Behold, he is coming with clouds and every eye will see him, even they who, per who pierced him. And all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him. Even so, amen. Verse 8. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. So we see this phrase, who is and is and is to come, both used for God in verse 4, then in verse 5 when we start talking about Jesus, and in verse 8 right here, we see this same phrase about Jesus, who is, who was, and is to come. Who was and is and is to come. You know? So it's talking about the timelessness of God, and the timelessness of Jesus. There is no beginning to God, there's no end to God. There is no beginning to Jesus, and there's no end to Jesus. God and Jesus and Holy Spirit have all equally coexisted and, and have been in existence before time was created. An infinite amount of time in the future and the infinite amount of time in the past. It's beyond our ability to comprehend, but they have always been. Nothing created them. Where did God come from? God is self-existent. You know, kids will ask you, where did, you know, where did, where does the earth come from? God made the earth. Well, who made God? You know, God made himself. I don't even know how to even answer that. He, he, he exists apart from anything. He is, he is who he is, the creator, the sustainer of life. So we see this, this uh, eternal existence of Jesus. Before he was born, he lived and existed along with the Father and along with Holy Spirit. Uh, so let's look at, let's take a look at, uh, there's other places too. There's three other places in Revelation that talks about him being who was and is and is to come. We're not going to spend the time in that. Turn to John chapter eight with me. John chapter eight, we read verses uh, 42 to 59. John 8, 42, Jesus said to them, If God were your father, you would love me, for I proceed forth and came from God, nor have I come of myself, but he sent me. Verse 43, Why do you not understand my speech? Because you are not able to listen to my word. You are of your father the devil, and the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, for he is a liar and the father of it. But because I tell you the truth, you do not believe me. Which of you convicts me of sin? And if I tell you the truth, why do you not believe me? He who is of God hears God's word. Therefore, you do not hear because you are not of God. Then the Jews answered and said to him, uh, Do we not say rightly that you are a Samaritan, have a demon? Jesus answered, I do not have a demon. But I honor my father, and you dishonor me. And I do not seek my own glory. There is one who seeks and judges. Most assuredly, I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, he shall never see death. When the Jews said to him, now uh, we know that you have a demon. Abraham is dead, and the prophets, and you say, if anyone keeps my word, he shall never taste death. Uh, 
you are, are you greater than our father Abraham who is dead and the prophets are dead? Why do you, uh, who do you make yourself out to be? Jesus answered, if I honor myself, my honor is nothing. It is my father who honors me of whom you say that he is your God. Yet you have not known him, but I know him. And if I say I do not know him, I, I shall be a liar like you, but I do not know, but I do know him and keep his word. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. Then the Jews said to him, You are not yet fifty years old, and have you seen Abraham? Jesus said to them, Most assuredly I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. Before Abraham was born, I already existed. Very clearly here. It's interesting to, uh, in the, we're not going to take the time this morning, but if you look at the account of Abraham, being Abraham was a pagan. His father was the high priest of the worshiping of a celestial religion. He worshiped the, the bodies, the, uh, the planets and the stars and the, and the constellations and things like that. And Abraham was being trained up by his father to be the next priest of his tribe to teach this religion. And God appeared to Abraham. And uh, he came in, the, uh, three messengers from God came. There are theologians that believe that one of those messengers was Jesus. That Jesus took on a physical form along with two other angels and came to Abraham and had, conver and had conversation with him. There is, uh, there is a term, the angel of the Lord, is found about 50 times in the New Testament, the angel of the Lord. And there are theologians that believe that that term, the angel of the Lord, is actually referring to Jesus and his pre-carnate. Carnate means flesh. His, before he took on flesh, before he was born in 3 or 4 BC, whenever that exact date was, not December, because it wasn't in December, probably, probably sometime in the spring that Jesus was born. But besides all of that, uh, that before Jesus actually came to the earth in physical form, that he manifested himself and appeared to multiple individuals uh, in the Old Testament. So we see this. Uh, let's flip over to, to uh, John 10 now. John 10, begin with verse 22. We have another discourse here with Jesus and religious leaders. Uh, verse 22, now it was the feast of dedication in Jerusalem, and it was winter, and Jesus <clears throat> walked in the temple in Solomon's porch. Uh, then the Jews surrounded him and said to him, how long do you keep us in doubt? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answered them, I told you, and you, God bless you. I told you, and, I do, and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. But you do not believe because you are not of my sheep. As I said to you, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. Verse 30, I and my Father are one. I and my Father are one. That word one means it's like being, we are one race, the human race. We are all humans. Every single one of us are, are humans, and we're a part of the human race. Therefore, we are of what? One race. So when he says this, I and my Father are one, he's saying, I and my Father are the same. I and my Father is like being, are the same. We're, like, we're both humans. They're not both, obviously, they're not both humans. I mean, Jesus is 100% human. 100% man as he's walking on the earth. But he's saying the Father and I are of the same race, if you will. <clears throat> they are, not only are they of the same race, race, but you have to be clear and recognize that the Trinity, the doctrine of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, they're co-equal, they coexist, they are one and the same, expressed in different ways. It isn't that God is, is number one and Jesus is number two and Holy Spirit's the third in rank and file or anything like that but they are one in, in the same. So Jesus is saying here, the Father and I are one in essence. We are one in person. We are one in being. We are one in the same. The Bible says if we've seen Jesus, you've seen the Father. Scripture says that Jesus' ministry was the expressed image of the Father. The, the exact image of who, Je of, of who God is can be found in Jesus. If you want to know God, study Jesus. Study the heart and passion of Jesus, the ministry of Jesus, know what the heart and passion of God is to the human race. Hallelujah. You want to understand God of the Old Testament? 
understand the God of the New Testament. So you're able to go back to the God of the Old Testament and be able to rightly discern and rightly navigate through that. We don't have two gods, one angry God who's bringing vengeance upon sin in the Old Testament and a merciful Jesus in the New Testament. They're one and the same God. God gave Jesus. Why? Because it's God's grace and his mercy he wanted to pour out. The Bible says God takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked. Let's take any pleasure in that. God desires that all men everywhere would be saved. That's his desire for mankind, for the human race. And he sent Jesus, his only son, to the earth to do that and make the way for us to, to, to come into relationship with him. But go to 1 John with me. 1 John chapter 1. Got you guys going all over the place this morning. You're either sliding up your phone or you're falling asleep or you're actually turning pages. I hear a few pages turning. I like that. I like the sound of pages being turned. Turn your pages. Make a bunch of noise with your pages. Yeah, I like it. I like it. <laughs> Glory to God. I hope it isn't. Uh, hope those pages aren't stuck together because you have a new Bible and this is only the, you've had it for five years and you haven't opened it together. My dad had a new Bible one time. Somebody gave him a Bible. It was a real nice leather back Bible. And he really didn't use it much because he liked it. I mean, he didn't want to mess it up, you know. So he would use other Bibles at home. So one time he was uh, with... Uh, Brother Nick and Pastor Nick and we were standing around and he was trying to get to get to the page that we're, we're studying around a table and the pages are stuck together, you know, because it was because it was because he brought that Bible. So Nick said something about brother, how long have you had that Bible and then pages are still stuck together, you know. <laughs> <clears throat> well, I was able to verify. So my dad said, this is my good Bible. I don't use it much. You know, and I said, I can verify that he's got other Bibles he reads. You know, can, that's not uh, not the case. So. First John, where are we at? First John chapter 1. I'm in Revelation, so let's get back to John. Come on, come on. My pages are stuck together. But it's the peanut butter. It's peanut butter, though. It's not because it's new. Almond butter. It's the honey. I pour honey on there and lick it off the Bible. First uh, John chapter 1, verses 1 through 5. That which was from the beginning, which we heard, which we have seen with our own eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled concerning the word of life. The life was manifested, and we have seen, and bear witness, and declare to you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us, that, that which we have seen and heard and declare to you, that you also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And these things we write to you, that your joy may be full. This is the message, and I am in the wrong John. I thought, I think, why am I reading this? Sorry, guys, Gospel of John. Gospel of John. Go to the Gospel of John. I'm reading, I'm liking it, I love the Word of God. I'm thinking, I didn't read this, I didn't prepare this for this. What's going on here? John 1. This is called the Genesis. I love John. I love the Gospel of John. It's my favorite of the four Gospels. I love the Gospel of John for multiple reasons, but the Gospel of John is, is called the Genesis of the New Testament. The word Genesis means beginning. So this is the beginning of the New Testament. It's, if I was to do anything with the Bible, I would rearrange it and make the New Testament begin in the Gospel of John. I would just do that, you know, because it's really the beginning before Jesus' birth. I mean, obviously, we start off with what Jesus' physical birth, but he existed prior to that. So John tells us very clearly here in John chapter 1 that he existed before his physical birth was. So now, Gospel of John, everybody, chapter 1, verses 1 through 5. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him. And without him, nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shined in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it, did not see it, did not understand it, uh, did not, did not uh, 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 receive it. So we see this at the very beginning of creation, guys. This is when I were to, I were, we're going to parallel Genesis, uh, John chapter 1 with Genesis chapter 1. In the beginning was the word. Genesis starts off by saying what? In the beginning, there was what? There was God, yes. 
uh, was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Who are we talking about? Who is the Word? Who is the living Word? Jesus himself. We're talking about Jesus here. In the beginning was Jesus, and Jesus was with God, and Jesus was God. Take that word out, out word and put Jesus in there, and it's the same thing. You can interchange those two words. Now, is that any more clear that Jesus is God? Can't be much more clear than that, right? Hello? Anybody with me? Amen. Yeah, the, you know, the, 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 the deity of Jesus cannot be denied. Verse 2, that's if you value the scriptures, and your scriptures are your authority to determine what truth is. Jesus was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Jesus, and without Jesus, nothing was made that was made. In Jesus was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shined in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. So we see here very clearly, uh, clear as it can be, that, that Jesus is, is God, one and the same. We, verse 4, in him was life, and the life was the light of men. So we see both physical life and spiritual life is because of Jesus. He's the author of life. He's the giver of life. He's the sustainer of life. Read on in uh, John here. Go to verse 8. And verse 9. Verse 9. That was, the, that was the true light, which gives light to every man coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the, light, the right to become the children of God to those who believed in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but born of God. Born of, how many of you are grateful for your born-again experience of knowing Jesus as your personal Savior? Born by the Holy Spirit into the kingdom of God. Adopted into the kingdom of God. Pulled out, rescued from the fires of hell. Pulled out, transplanted from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of the light of the love of his son. It's awesome, saints. We are the most privileged individuals on the planet. The most valuable thing that you could possibly have in your life is the reality of your salvation in through Christ. Can, anybody, can I get at least one amen from that? Amen. I mean, and it, and it doesn't matter, you know, you got to force your soul to lift up your voice, as Pastor Kenneth said, you know. I mean, there, there's sometimes you don't feel that way. You know, anybody ever feel like you're not adopted son of God? Everybody, anybody ever feel like maybe your sins aren't forgiven? I mean, we, we don't live by, we live by faith, right? Not by feeling, not by sight, not by sound, but by faith. Faith in the son of God, faith in the word of God. And the, and the more we give ourselves to that and we begin to declare what God has said verbally, we can bring ourselves, <clears throat> our feelings will fall into alignment with, what, with the truth of God's word. There's an old song we used to sing. No matter what the circumstances, what I feel or see, the word is working mightily in me. The word is working mightily in me. The word is working mightily in me. No matter what the circumstances, what I feel or see, oh, the word is working mightily in me. So, that, guys, the word is Jesus. The word is the Holy Spirit. But the word is also on the black and white, which we are so privileged to have. There are people that don't have this. There are languages, there are people that are living on the planet right now that don't have the written word of God, don't have the ability to read that word. We have it multiple sources. I mean, all kinds of sources. Cassette tapes. Anybody have it? Cassette tapes. Anybody remember what cassette tapes were? Anybody still using eight-track tapes? You know, back. <laughs> I believe it. You got some old cars probably have factory eight tracks still in them. Uh, so we see this, uh, this word is alive in us, saints. The word of God is sharper than a two-edged sword, and it's able to bring life. We were not born, verse 13, who were born not of blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. I'm going to continue with this. Verse 14, 1 John. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus, God himself, put on flesh, came to the earth. Behold, his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John the Baptist bore witness of him and cries out, saying, This was he of whom I said, He whom comes after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. Which is interesting, because who was born first, John the Baptist or Jesus? John the Baptist was born three months before Jesus was born. And, he, and, Jesus is saying, and John the Baptist is saying, Jesus was before me. Well, how can he be before you if you're older than he is? 
because he always has been. It's always his constant, saints. It constantly comes up. It's constantly there to verify the reality of that. Uh, verse 16. And of his fullness we have all received and grace for grace. The law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has seen God at any time, the only begotten Son, who is in the bosom of the Father. He has declared him. The word declared means to unfold who God is. So, so Jesus has unfolded to us who God is. There's, there's no places that are better to understand who God is than to, than to read all the red letters when Jesus talks about him and his Father, when he talks about the, the Father, when he talks about the Father's will and the Father's plan and his relationship with his Father. It's beautiful. Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. Hebrews 1, 1 through 4. God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the expressed image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become so much better than the angels, as he has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they have. Praise God, saints. Aren't you glad for the finished work of Jesus? Are you not, are you not happy, happy, happy? I said, old Duck Dynasty guys, are you happy, happy, happy? You know, happy, happy, happy that your sins are forgiven, they're washed in the blood, that your name is in the Lamb's Book of Life, that you have, that there is no fear in death. You can look death right in the face and smile because you know right on the other side of just, just uh, right on the other side of death is going to be Jesus standing there with a smile on his face, Amen. receiving you to glory. Amen. Amen. Praise God. So there is no, there is no victory in the grave. There is no, there is no, doesn't win. The, the grave does not win. We're all going to die, right? Your physical body is only designed to last for a maximum maybe, maybe what I think 120 years is the most, People live these days. If you read, you know, the oldest persons alive and stuff. Kirk Douglas. How many remember the old actor Kirk Douglas? He just died at 103, I think, here a few months ago, September. He was 103 years old, Kirk, Kirk Douglas. And uh, uh, I remember the old Viking movies, a bunch of old movies. I loved him. He was a good actor. The, uh, okay, where are we going next here? Colossians 1, verses 15 through 17. Colossians 1, 15 through 17. Jesus is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on the earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created through him and for him, and he is before all things, and in him all things consist. It's a pretty bold declaration of who Jesus is and his deity and his, his uh, continuous life and uh, in operation as the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords over all of creation. Saints, there's, a, there's clearly a difference between knowing about Jesus and knowing Jesus. Amen. Total difference. You know? I mean, I knew about God. I knew about Jesus. I grew up in church, had some verses, and it wasn't until, it wasn't until I came into the, the encounter of the born-again experience that I came from shifting from knowing a conscious awareness. You know, I, was, I went from being God conscious to being a new, a new man in Christ, a new creation in Christ. The Holy Spirit entering my spirit, joining himself with me, making me the adopted son of God, making you the adopted sons and daughters of God. It is, it is I'll never, ever, ever, ever ex forget that experience. Never, ever. I mean, things, in an instant, things changed. My, perspect my perception of reality changed. My my value system changed. I already knew by the Holy Spirit that I had to get rid of my pornography. That I had to get rid of my, my cultic stuff that I had at home. Uh, that, my, that was the end of, you know, you know, that there wasn't going to be any more alcohol in my life ever again. I mean, instantly knew all these things from the, the moment that conversion. I, knew, I came home and took all my cultic stuff, took my, uh, all my Playboy magazines, piled them all up in the back of the house, poured gasoline on them and lit them on fire. And, and uh, other cultic stuff, books I had, threw them in there and, and, and burned them. I didn't even know the scripture said you're supposed to do what? 
burn that stuff. Yeah, and if it can't be burned, you're supposed to pound it into powder, like if you have some kind of a stone statue or, mace, or, or bronze or whatever, pagan thing, you, you bust it up and pass it through the fire to purify it. Um, so, I mean, that happened. And then I began to study God's word and find out all kind of stuff that needed to be adjusted. There had to, the, the transformation of my mind began when I began to read the Bible with the Holy Spirit as my teacher for the first time in my life. Because I had read, I never read through the entire Bible, but I had read portions of the Bible. And, you know, I had gone to vacation Bible school, you know, I had gone to Sunday school, that kind of a stuff. So I knew some stuff. Uh, but I just had a head knowledge of, of him. I did not have, my heart was hard, my heart was selfish, my heart was pursuing, me, myself, and I was who was in charge. Those are the three most important people in my life until I met Jesus. And he, he flipped that thing all around. And I come to find out pretty soon later that if I wanted joy, J-O-Y, I had to make Jesus first in my life. I had to make others second in my life. And the last person had to be me, yourself, J-O-Y. Jesus, others, then yourself. Come into that. So that, that the process of transformation uh, began. Um, first John chapter 4. That's where I went to write because I knew it was going to be in First John. Go to First John, right before Revelations. You were there a little bit ago when I mis misdirected you to that. First John four, verses one through three. Behold, beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the spirit of God, every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come into the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard was coming and now already is in the world. You are not uh, of God, little children, and have over, you are of God, little children, and have overcome them because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. Okay, so we see this. The Bible says we need to try the spirits because why? But by this, verse 2, by this you will know the spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. Now, it's not enough to recognize that Jesus was a human being. When he's talking about Jesus Christ, we're talking, we have Jesus and Christ. The word Jesus is the, he is the one who is the Savior. He is the Messiah. He is the, uh, he is God's person, Jesus. And the word Christ means the anointed one. So we're talking about the one who contained, who contained the God. The Bible says that Jesus, and I can't get my head around this, okay? I'm just telling you what the scripture says. That Jesus contained the Godhead bodily. So that means in his physical body, he had God in there, he had himself in there, and he had the Holy Spirit in there. The Bible says that he contained the Spirit without measure. So he contained all that there was of the Holy Spirit all at the same time when he walked on the earth. So that's what we're talking about. If you don't embrace that, if you do not embrace that, God, that Jesus contained the Godhead bodily, that he was equal with God, that he and his Father were one, that he contained the Spirit without measure, that he was sinless, that he was 100% human and 100% divine at the same time. If you do not confess that, the scripture says what? You are of what? You just read it. Antichrist spirit. So it's the ant you're against Christ, Antichrist. You're, you're against Jesus. So we have religions, all the world religions of the world are against Jesus, saints. And it's part of what Satan's stealth efforts have been to have a form of power, have a form of godliness, that is denied the power. That's the verse we're going to end with. Go to 2 Timothy chapter 3 with me. 2 Timothy 3. I would just say this as well. The Antichrist spirit is part of atheism as well. You know, it's, it's part of humanism. You know, what, you know what humanism is, right? Humanism is the, is the idea that humans are the highest form of intelligence in the universe, or at least on this planet, and that, you know, that we as humans have the right to determine 
relative moralism, what's right for us and what's right for me might not be right for you. So, you know, we, we are, we have, we've ascended to this highest level of intellect and uh, there, there is nothing superior than human beings. That's what human is. That's the author of that is Satan himself, the liar of all lies. And that's governed and manipulated and controlled by an antichrist spirit as well. There's demons at work, saints. I mean, there is demons at work. You think that, you know, you think that all the problems we're having in America uh, is, you know, is just human conflict, no. philosophical differences, uh, you know, differences of opinion and moralism, or no. We're talking about a battle between the kingdom of light and the kingdom of darkness. A uh, huge battle that's going on right now. Satan is battling for the hearts and the minds of the, of the next generation, of every generation. Uh, 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5. But know this, that in the last days, perilous times will come. Now, this is interesting. This is written, what, 60, I think it's 60 A.D., you know, just you know, a few years after Jesus has ascended, 30 years after Jesus ascended, this is written, uh, that the last days. They were in the last days. I mean, they, they were in the, the beginning of the last days was when Jesus ascended into heaven. It was the beginning of the last days. So we are in the last days. We've been in the last days for 2,000, almost 2,000 years. So I think that, you know, the further we get along here, we're in the last of the last days. You know, the, we've, we've rounded third base and we're heading for home, you know. For men will be, verse 2, for men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, uh, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Verse 5, having a form of godliness but denying the power, denying its power of from such people turn away. Some people avoid, so these people don't get involved with them. So, He's, it's talking about anything that denies the power of God. And in most cases, well, in most cases, except for with, so within some fractions within Christianity, uh, every world religion denies the power, denies the power of the resurrection, denies the power of, the, of Jesus' sinful life. They deny his, deny his deity. So having a form of godliness, but de denying its power. So there's this outward form. Jesus called the Pharisees a bunch of... Uh, whitewashed pigs. They were all dressed up real nice. They had all the religious garb on. They talked the talk, but they didn't walk the walk, and their heart wasn't, where, it wasn't after God. Their heart was for the, to be seen of men, and he called them whitewashed. D dead men's bones, all dressed up with no place to go. Uh, Paul did the same thing with, with the religious leaders as well. So what is this power, this word power? Having a form of godliness, but denying its power. The power of the gospel. The Apostle Paul said in Acts 1, or, yeah, in Romans 1, 16, he says, I am not ashamed of the power of the gospel. For why? It is the salvation to all who believe, to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. For God has no respecter of person. There's a, there's a, he, is, he is not ashamed of the power of the gospel. Jesus told the disciples, go to Jerusalem, and when you receive, go to Jerusalem and tarry until you receive power. Dunamis, the same word, dunamis from on high. So power, saints, this word power this word power, when Jesus said, go to Jerusalem and receive the power, of the power of the baptism of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. This word, he said, I'll give you power to become witnesses to me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the outermost parts of the world. So this power has purpose. This power has purpose. Let's look at this word power a little bit. This word dunamis, this, what kind of power are we talking about here? Uh, this word deny means to reject those, refuse those, uh, be offended towards those who deny the power of God. Saints, we need the power of God in our lives and in our country, in our churches now more than we've ever needed it. We need the power of God. There needs to be a fresh outpouring of the power of the Holy Spirit upon America. It is its only hope. I stand here today to tell, declare to you as the minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ that unless there is a revival in America, it's going down the tubes. Political power isn't going to change it. Unlimited printing of money isn't going to fix it. We, you know, the only thing that's going to fix this thing is that when, when people get serious and repent and turn from their wicked ways, humble themselves, seek the Lord, then God's going to hear from heaven and we're going to have a, we're going to have a transformation. You know, I'm believing that. I'm, I'm praying to that end. And I hope I live long enough to see it, saints. We need a, we need a new great awakening. There was, a, there was two great awakenings that occurred. 
uh, it, it brought revival. We need another great awakening. So this word power is, the word dunamis means supernatural miracle enablement. Supernatural miracle enablement. And it begins with the, the, the miracle of new birth. The miracle that sinful people can be forgiven of their sins, unregenerated people, people who are spiritually dead, who are dead in their trespasses and sin, can be forgiven and made alive by the entrance of the Holy Spirit into their, when they, when they come to a saving faith in Jesus, and you experience the, the, the transformational power of becoming born again by the power of God. That's a miracle, saints. That's, that's a tremendous miracle. You've experienced a miracle. Everybody said, you ever see a miracle? I've seen a miracle. You know, I've had people, shortly after I got saved, guys that I ran with, they said, there must be a miracle. Rich Liptak gave up drug, drugs and all this other kind of stuff, and now he's serving God. He's a Christian. There must be a God in heaven. It must be a miracle. Amen. A miracle transformation of the new birth. Don't, don't underestimate under, uh, that. You know, declare that. You are new creations in Christ because of the entrance, because of the miracle of salvation that has occurred in your life, saints. A miracle of salvation. This thing, this dunamis power is also moral power and excellence of soul. Moral power and excellence of soul. Talk about that just for a second. This moral power, spiritual moral power, being able to bring us into the, into the, uh, the, the, the spiritual moral code of conduct, if you will, that's in the scriptures. It's not something that you do by human effort. It's something that transpires within you as a result of the new birth, by being new creations in Christ. Now, you have to cooperate with that. You have to get into God's word to have your mind transformed. You have to believe it. You have to settle it. You have to crucify the flesh. There's a lot of activities that you're involved with that in. But the enablement of that comes not from human soul power, willpower, but it comes from supernatural power that resides within you. This ability to transform your life into the image of Jesus. So we have this, we, this moral power and excellence of soul does this. It, o- it overcomes life-controlling sin. How many of you can testify that since you've been born again, that you've had life-controlling sin has been overcome, not by your grit and determination and your, you know, your, the application of your, of your own mind and will, but by the power of the resurrected Jesus that resides within you. Can I see some hands? Yes. Praise God. Yes. Overcoming life-controlling sin. Second one is a transformed mind. A transformed mind. The Bible says there was a veil of unbelief over our eyes. Even when we read the scriptures, you know, there, uh, I read the scriptures. How many of you read the scriptures and didn't make any sense to you? How many of you read the, read the scriptures and, and, and it, you know, now it was building faith in you as you read, this, read those scriptures. But the Bible says that Satan had a veil of unbelief over our eyes. And in the moment we become born again, that veil is removed. And we begin to have a transformed mind. The Holy Spirit becomes our teacher. Our whole value system changes. We, 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 do, we have a paradigm shift. We begin to value things the way God values things. We begin to realize that God doesn't make junk. That every single human being is precious. Whether, it's the, whether the human being is in the womb, whether the human being is in the hospice, and making no contribution of any kind to society. We're not going to euthanize old people or, youth, or you know, whatever, you know, abort uh, babies. Hope you guys are praying for the things that are going on in the Supreme Court right now. There's a lot of activity going on right now that could change this Roe versus Wade, and which, which would be awesome to, to, to remove this blight against America uh, and, and, and reverse that thing. You can't legislate moralism, though. It has to be. I mean, that helps. But you can't, you know, that, that isn't going to fix this thing. We need, again, we still need this revival. Complete change in moral system. Second thing, power to perform miracles. Very, very clearly, power to perform miracles. Jesus needed miracles. Jesus said, if you don't believe me for the words that I say, believe me for what? The miracles that I do, the signs and the wonders that I do. The Bible says all those that believe in Jesus and follow him, these signs will follow those that believe. They shall cast out devils, lay hands upon the sick to recover, speak with new tongues. <clears throat> this is for today as much as it was for the disciples, saints. He told the disciples, those who believe, those who believe, those who believe. The problem is we have an unbelieving church in America today. You know, the, the full gospel church is diminishing in America today. The Pentecostal experience is not being offered today in church. Because some people are a little wigged out about this Holy Ghost thing and they, they don't come. You know, 
I've, I've, I've read books, I've been YouTube conferences, things, leaders training, and you need to like cool it on the Holy Spirit stuff if you want to fill up your church. So, you know, you can, we can have people, you, you, you want a bunch of people that don't know Jesus just sitting in here kind of like, or do you want people that know Jesus or on fire on Jesus? I want people that are on fire and know Jesus. So anybody comes in here, I want them to know Jesus and get on fire for Jesus. Amen? These uh, uh, performing miracles include sharing the gospel, which produces salvation. That's a miracle, saints. It's a miracle that you receive salvation, and we have the privilege of carrying that miracle to others and telling other individuals about Jesus. It's a miracle that you share the gospel message with someone, and the Holy Spirit brings the revelation to them. It isn't your eloquent words. It isn't the scriptures that you memorize. It isn't your clever stories. It isn't any of those kinds of things. It's God using you and anointing you to bring forth a word of life to someone. The Bible says one of us plants, another one waters. God gives the increase, and what do we have? We have new life that occurs, saints. Amen. We have new life that occurs. Every one of us, that's our privilege and our responsibility and our duty as soldiers for Christ is to be ready to give an answer for the hope that's within you. You've got to be ready to do that, saints. It's a miracle. You want to see the Holy Ghost move in your life? Start opening up your mouth and sharing the love of Jesus with other individuals. You're going to see the Holy Spirit show up in a powerful way. Take a chance and pray for somebody who's sick and lay their hand on them. I can guarantee you this. They'll be touched by your compassion even if the Holy Ghost doesn't show up and heal them. It'll be a whole lot better saying, I'll pray for you. How many of you, and I've said this too, I, I, try, I actually try not to say this. I'll pray for you, but then you never do. You better pray for them right then. Then you don't have to worry about saying you'll pray for them. You don't have to worry about remembering it or whatever. Put your hand on them and pray for them right there. I don't care if you're in the grocery store, you're in a parking lot, wherever. Do it. This power to perform miracles is also gives us the ability to perform, uh, yeah, perform signs and wonders, function in spiritual gifts. Function in spiritual gifts. The Bible says that he's given to every one of us spiritual gifts. Holy Spirit wants to give us, uh, gives us the Bible says, if we ask, he will not withhold any good thing from us. How much more will the Heavenly Father give us the Holy Spirit if we ask him for it? So we can have more of that. One other thing here, we have Holy Spirit boldness and fearlessness. How many of you had a fear of death and it's been overcome by the power of the Holy Spirit within your life? Anybody in here can say that? Yeah, there is no death. There is no death. God knows when I'm going to come home and how I'm going to come home. Amen. So I'm not sweating it, you know. I mean, Kath and I got covid I'm not even sure if I got it. I, said, I tested positive, but I really didn't have any symptoms. Kath got it, and not for one second did, I, did my heart become gripped with fear, thinking, oh, my God, I'm going to lose my wife to COVID because I've lost friends to COVID. I know people that have died from COVID. Oh, no, you know, whatever. God is God, is God man. He knows the beginning from the end. He knows my days. He knows the number of hairs on my head. He knows where we're planning. Whatever happens is his, is his perfect plan. I'm trusting in him. I'm trusting in him. So I had per, t- total peace. The only thing that bummed me out, I was like, for a whole week, I couldn't kiss her. I couldn't even hug her for a whole week, man. I was like, it was kind of a nice little break because it reminded me how much I appreciate that, how, how much I, I love her. So, so as soon as my test came back positive, even though I didn't have any symptoms, I said, guess what's going to happen today, Kath? She says, what? I'm going to kiss you. I'm going to hug you and kiss you. Right and I did. So, Holy Spirit boldness and fearlessness against anything. How many of you have experienced things that you were afraid of that have, have vanished by the power and presence of the Holy Spirit in your life. Yes. Praise God. I love it. Look at all these testimonies of the miracle work. See, God is working in you. There's miracles working in within you. The last part of this power is it's, it's divine ability bestowed upon individuals or groups. Oftentimes, the Holy Spirit falls upon a group. I'm asking the Holy Spirit to fall on this group. Here at Wildwood Chapel, I want to I want to see a powerful. I'm looking forward to the 21 day fast. We're going to start up here as soon as the Christmas thing is over. I mean, you mark your calendars. That'll be January 3rd because I think no January 1 is Sunday. No Saturday. January 1 is Saturday, so Saturday and Sunday is the second. We'll start our fast on the third. January 3rd, we're going to be beginning our beginning our fast. So um, we have this worship team. You guys want to come up? How many of you appreciate Jesus? How many of you, how many of you, are, how many of you are hungry and thirsty for some a fresh outpouring of Holy Spirit power and presence in your life? Just about a third of you, 
rest of you guys, I pray that I pray that the third of us that have our hands up get it, and it becomes so contagious that even if you didn't put your hand up, you get it. It splashes on you and gets you gets you fired up as well. So I'll stand up. We're going to worship the Lord.